Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to hear from you when your word is spoken. Lord, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Lord, may we behold you in the pages of your word. And Lord, may it cause our um, hearts to long for the day when you will make all of your promises come true and we shall see your son as he is. Lord, until then, Lord, may we live by faith and grow our confidence in your word. And Lord, as we sing this evening that you are our mighty fortress, as we open the words of Nahum, Lord, may we look to you as our refuge. In your name we pray, amen. Well, on Sunday evenings, we've been going through the 66 books of the Bible, and this has just been a really sweet opportunity to, for us to spend some time looking at some books of the Bible that we are just less familiar with. Uh, I don't know if you are on a reading plan, maybe a yearly reading plan. Um, if you're not, you should be, if I could recommend that. But if you're like many of us who use the McShane's reading plan, you get to the book of Nahum in the beginning of December. And I don't know if you've ever fallen behind in your reading plan. So at the end of the year, you're trying to rush through things to catch up so you can start over in January or more. Maybe you just hit the eject button and you'll just start over again in January. Well, what's the result of that? Is that we sometimes rush over or we miss the book of Nahum. And we become very unfamiliar with these three chapters in our Bibles. And I don't know when the last time you read this book is, and, but do you remember what it's about? Do you remember who it's to? Well, hopefully, at the end of this evening, we'll be more familiar with, with it. Um, the last 12 books of the Old Testament are the minor prophets. And they're not minor because they're less important. They're minor because they're shorter. They're shorter compared to the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the longer prophets. And the book of Jonah is probably the best known of all the minor prophets, probably the most loved. The book of Nahum, the sequel to the book of Jonah, is one of the less familiar minor prophets and probably doesn't top many people's list as their favorite book of the Bible. I could be wrong. But why is Nahum the sequel to Jonah? Uh, remember in Jonah that the people of Nineveh, the great capital of the Assyrian Empire, had escaped destruction by turning from their sin. And in Nahum, more than a century later, Nahum has showed up to deliver a message of destruction for Nineveh, whose repentance and any effects of it have long since passed. So Nahum must be read with the background of Jonah in mind. But there's another connection that we must see if we are to understand the book of Nahum. And as someone is fond of saying at this church, all roads lead back to Torah. Yeah, the first five books of the Bible. And Jonah and Nahum don't only have God's dealings with Nineveh in common, but they actually look back upon the same passage from the Torah as an important, explicit, foundational connection for both books. So it's worth spending a little bit of time in Exodus this evening and then visiting Jonah once more before we make our way to the book of Nahum. So open your Bibles to the book of Exodus, Exodus 33. Exodus 33. Um, Exodus 33 and 34 contain one of the defining moments in the life of Israel and in detailing their covenant relationship with Yahweh. If you recall, God has instructed Moses to lead the people away from Sinai towards the promised land. And then we see this prayer in Exodus 33, verse 13. So now, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. See also that this nation is your people. Moses prays that he would know God's ways so that he may know him and find favor. And that's really instructive for us. Do we long to know God's ways so that we can know him better? And find favor and grace and mercy. Well, that's reason and motivation enough for us to read the book of Nahum this evening. 
Uh, But in verse 14, Yahweh responds to Moses' request. Look at verse 14. And he said, My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. And this is the, the great promise of the Bible to God's people, God's presence and future rest. And despite their idolatry with the golden calf, God will not remove his presence from his people. He forgives their sin, and his presence will remain with them, and he will one day be rest for his people. He will bring rest for his people. Well, in verse 14, 15, Moses says, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. And Moses seems to be struggling to take God at his word at this time. Can God be trusted? Can God's word be trusted? Moses continues, verse 16, Indeed, how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us, so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? God, how will I and the people and the nations know that you have chosen us if you don't go with us? Uh, Moses is still fearful. He needs reassurance. But God is patient and merciful towards him. Look at verse 17. Then Yahweh said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken. For you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. In these few verses, Moses prays that he would know Yahweh's ways, that he might know him. He prays for God's continual presence and that the nations would know his choice of Israel. And then finally, he prays for God to show him his glory. And Yahweh responds, I will show you my goodness. My goodness will pass before you. And in verse 22, while my glory is passing by, God's goodness in this passage is his glory, his character, his name. And his glory is seen in the manifestation of who he is. If you see my goodness, you see my glory. And how does God make his goodness pass before Moses? What does it look like? Well, notice in verse 19, it is proclaimed. Verse 19, I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. A key component of God's goodness and glory is his sovereign choice to show compassion on undeserving sinners whom he chooses. Israel is undeserving, but God is free to glorify himself by choosing to show them compassion. Even when they sin against him, even when they commit idolatry, he is free to show compassion on whomever he wishes. And it's as if God says, Moses, you want to see my ways that you may know me. You want to see my goodness and my glory. Watch me show compassion on whomever I will and withhold it from whoever I will. When you see me showing compassion, you see my goodness and my glory. When you see me withholding compassion, you see my goodness and my glory. Well, in the next few verses, God promises to protect Moses from seeing the full physical manifestation of his glory as he causes his goodness to pass him by. But first, before that happens, God writes commands on two tablets of stone for the second time and he descends in a cloud and he stands next to Moses and in Exodus 34 6 make sure you turn to Exodus 34 6 we get to the main event where God Yahweh's goodness and glory will pass by Moses but again the focus is not on what Moses can see but on what God proclaims so in 34 6 God proclaims his goodness, his glory, and his name. 34, 6, then Yahweh passed by in front of him and called out, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet 
he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. You want to know my ways, that you know me, Moses. Watch me show compassion on whom I choose. Behold my goodness and glory when I am patient and I forgive man's sin. Watch me show goodness and glory when I punish man's sin. In Exodus, we clearly see that to know God, we must know his ways. And we must know him in his compassion and his patience and his forgiveness. We must also know him in his justice and his punishment of sin. And it is this very revelation of Yahweh as he who judges and he who forgives that is at the heart of Jonah's disobedience. Turn to Jonah 4. Jonah 4. We were here just two weeks ago. Yahweh had commanded Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach a message of destruction and repentance, but Jonah didn't obey God. Why? I'll read Jonah 4, verse 2. Jonah 4, 2. And he prayed to Yahweh and said, Ah, O Yahweh, was not this my word to myself while I was still in my own land? Therefore I went ahead to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents concerning evil. He quotes Exodus 34, Numbers 14. Actually, Jonah's actually quoting the prophet Joel, who was quoting Moses, showing that Jonah was familiar not only with Moses, but also with Joel's prophecy just a couple decades before him. And Jonah didn't want to see God's forgiveness come to the people of Nineveh. He wanted Nineveh to experience the second half of the verse, when God doesn't leave the guilty unpunished, but compassion, God's compassion, he wanted to reserve that for his own people. And Jonah's disobedience is a rejection of withholding and seeing the full manifestation of God's goodness and glory. God isn't just a patient God. He is a God who also judges. You want to know God? You must know God in his ways, in all of his ways. And as we know, Nineveh repented. Um, God relented concerning his judgment, choosing to be gracious and compassionate to whomever he would choose. And in this case, it was Nineveh. But Jonah was concerned about the destruction of a plant. God was concerned about the destruction of a people. But Nineveh's repentance would not last. And so 125 years later, God would again promise judgment on Nineveh in the book of Nahum. So turn to the opening words of Nahum. Nahum 1, 1 through 3. And we'll read those together as a way of introduction. The oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh is avenging against his adversaries and he keeps his anger for his enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power. And Yahweh will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. There again, Exodus 34. As Jonah ends with Exodus 34, Nahum opens with it. In Jonah, Nineveh served as a powerful illustration of God's compassion, patience, and forgiveness from Exodus 34. But in Nahum, God will manifest his goodness and glory in punishing Nineveh's sin. God may be slow to anger, but in Nahum, we'll see that God's patience has a limit. In verse 3, God describes himself three times as avenging. The time for punishment has come on Nineveh. In Nahum, we might say that Jonah finally gets his wish on the people of Nineveh. But how should we understand the difference between Jonah and Nahum? Uh, Was God showing his goodness in Jonah, but only his anger in Nahum? Recall Exodus, God was proclaiming his glory and goodness, and in that, he describes both attributes. And so too in Nahum, we see that even though Nahum is unquestionably about punishment of sin, In judgment, God's goodness is always on display. His holiness is always on display. His righteousness. And that's further evident in verses 6 and 7. So look down to verses 6 and 7 of Nahum 1. Who can stand before 
his indignation. Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are torn down by him. Yahweh is good. A strong defense in the day of distress. And he knows those who take refuge in him. Right in a book, dealing with the coming destruction of Nineveh, what Nahum proclaims is Yahweh is good. He is a refuge. If we are to know God, we must be acquainted with all of his ways. We must not turn a blind eye to his ways that we dislike, to his ways that indict our conscience, our sensibilities. Jonah turned a blind eye, a selective blind eye to God's forgiveness. Oh, sure, he needed it, but not those other people. Today, we might be more inclined to turn a blind eye to the justice and wrath of God. Do we avoid the minor prophets because they're uncomfortable? Can I encourage you to spend time in books like Nahum? They are about God's judgment, but they are also about his goodness. And its words actually provide hope to God's children. Yahweh is a good, strong defense in the day of distress. He knows those who take refuge in him. Here at the beginning of a book of judgment, the source of hope and refuge is made clear. Seek your refuge in God. Well, you've been looking at a blank screen. We'll put the theme of the book up. The theme of the book of Nahum is God will judge the wicked. Be comforted, but be warned. Um, What is the purpose of the book of Nahum? Well, Nahum reveals the goodness and glory of God manifested in his punishment of Nineveh's sin to serve as both a source of comfort and warning to Judah to trust in Yahweh alone as they await his promised future rest. So we're already in Nineveh 1. We're going to be, uh, we'll put the entirety of the outline on the screen. The outline and the purpose will all, though, did the purpose of statement ever get up there? I, maybe I missed it. This will all be available on the handout on the website. So we'll put the, the entirety of the outline up here. We're going to be reading through the entirety of the book. It's only three chapters, but we'll do it in chunks. And so I'll put the entirety of the outline. It's actually really small that I'm looking at that. Oh, it's smaller for me. So so let's start in verse 1-1, in which we read, The Oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. Well, Nahum is a prophet who we don't know a lot about, but he delivered God's words. And notice in verse 1 that this is a book of the vision or a scroll of the vision. While all prophecies that we have in the Old Testament were eventually recorded in scrolls or books, they were often first delivered verbally to the people to whom they were addressed and then later recorded under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But Nahum appears to be a prophecy first and foremost committed to writing, to a book, to a scroll. Did Nahum ever preach these words to Nineveh? Did he ever preach these words to Judah? We don't know. Were these words even delivered to Nineveh? We don't know, but like the book of Obadiah, which was addressed towards Edom, the book of Nahum is addressed towards Nineveh, but the primary audience of the book, like Obadiah, is God's people. Judah is the primary audience. It was Judah who needed to take the heed to the words of this book. And it is a future generation of Judah that would potentially find the greatest comfort in these words. So let's consider how Judah might have received this message by thinking of the historical setting. For centuries, the Assyrians had afflicted Judah. They took the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity in 722 BC. In 701 BC, Yahweh had actually struck 185,000 Assyrians dead at night in Jerusalem before their king, Sennacherib, actually fled back to Nineveh and died. And that's all recorded in Isaiah 37. But Assyria would recover from that loss. And by 663 BC, the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal had expanded his conquests hundreds of miles into Egypt and had captured Egypt's northern capital in Thebes. Even Egypt, 
another great world power had fallen to Assyria. And the, the defeat of Thebes is actually referenced in Nahum 3 and provides the best contextual clue as to the dating of Nahum. And it's helpful to date this book shortly after that destruction of Thebes, um, during the height of the Assyrian Empire, during the reign of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh, and likely during the end of the reign of Manasseh in Judah, likely around 650 B.C., can't be definitive on that dating, but that seems to be the best kind of recommendation. And if you recall that the king Manasseh was an evil king. He built altars to foreign gods in the temple, and he made his son to pass through fire, and he, pa- and he practiced witchcraft and all sorts of evil. Worst of all, 2 Kings 21, verse 9 says, you can write this down, he led Judah astray in order to do more evil than the nations whom Yahweh destroyed before the sons of Israel. So as we read the descriptions of Nineveh and their sin, the king that's sitting on the throne in Judah has led the nation in sins that are worse than those of the nations around them, worse even than Nineveh. Recall, um, Nineveh, Assyria's great capital, was actually described by God in Jonah as the great city. It was great in size and splendor, architecture and military power. And if you recall from Jonah, it would take him three days to actually walk throughout the city. It had a series of walls surrounding the city. The inner walls were about 100 feet tall and the width of them was such that three chariots side by side could race on top of the wall. And this is just a, an enormous wall, and that's the inner wall. There's also an outer wall. On the outside of the outer wall, they had a moat. And there was a moat that was 150 feet wide and 60 feet deep. I mean, just a, that's a, that's a barrier to any attacking army. And, and they had an abundance of water, hence their moat. They lived at the convergence of the Tigris and the Kosa River. So just Water was abundant. It was an abundant resource, and they used it for their agriculture. They used it for the defense. And they were at the height of their power and prestige in the world, and they also were known as a notoriously brutal nation to its surrounding neighbors. So this is a dark time in Judah's history. They've been suffering under the mighty Assyria and following their, the sins of their idolatrous king Manasseh. And a prophet like Jonah was also certainly not remembered fondly by the people. They wouldn't have Assyria as such a powerful enemy today if God had destroyed Nineveh back then. While being threatened and oppressed by this great power, Nahum comes on the scene and prophesies Nineveh's destruction. But throughout the message of Nineveh's destruction is a message intended for the people of God. Why? What should Israel take away from this description of Nineveh's fall? What should we take away from it? Well, Nahum's name means comfort or consolation, and that is exactly what this prophecy should have been to the people of Judah, comfort and hope. As we read through the entirety of the book in sections, ask yourselves what might be a comfort and a hope to God's people. And as we read, also pay attention to God's humbling of this mighty water people with the very source of their strength, their, their technology and their, and their water that surrounds them. So with that, we'll come to this description in the opening eight verses of the book, the powerful judge, the description of the powerful judge. We'll begin reading in verse 2. A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh is avenging against his adversaries, and he keeps his anger for his enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power, and Yahweh will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel languish. The blossoms of Lebanon languish. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills melt. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. 
Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are torn down by him. Yahweh is good, a strong defense in the day of distress. And he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete destruction of its place and will pursue his enemies into darkness. While God is a powerful judge, he is good. He is a source of refuge. But Nineveh, he will make a complete end with an overflowing flood. And this flood language isn't just poetic destruction language, but describes the very method of Nineveh's destruction in 612 BC. Um, Around 40 years after the writing of um, Nahum in 612, the river Koser that was next to Nineveh was swollen up by rains and rapid in current, and it overflowed and carried away a portion of that giant wall. And that left it open for the Medes and the Babylonians to flow in and lay siege to the city. This isn't just poetic language. This is actually a prediction of how Nineveh's doom would come. With that, we'll look to verse 9. This is the unstoppable judgment of God. Whatever you devise against Yahweh, he will make a complete destruction of it. Distress will not rise up twice like tangled thorns and like those who are drunken with their drink, they are consumed as stubble fully dried up. From you has gone forth one who devised evil against Yahweh, a vile counselor. Thus says Yahweh, though they are at full strength and likewise many, even so they will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no longer. So now I will break his yoke bar from upon you, and I will break your bands apart. In the midst of unstoppable judgment, we see the end of Judah's affliction by Assyria. With words addressed directly to God's people, I will afflict you no longer. I will break his yoke bar from upon you. God will judge those who afflict Judah, and Nineveh's judgment will actually mean freedom for the people. Well, in verse 14 of chapter 1, the God's judgment is decreed. Read in verse 14, and Yahweh has commanded concerning you, there will no longer be seed from your name from the house of your gods. I will cut off graven image and molten image. I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. Nineveh will utterly fall. And they will be thoroughly cut off. Continue in verse 15. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who proclaims good news, who announces peace. Celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Pay your vows, for never again will the vile one pass through you. He is cut off completely. Nineveh's destruction was to be a cause for rejoicing in Israel, in Judah. Nineveh's destruction was certain and would be complete, and it would be good news. 1 verse 15 calls to mind the prophet Isaiah's words from both Isaiah 40 verse 9 and Isaiah 52. Um, This language from Isaiah 40, I'll just read some of Isaiah 40 and how it opens. Comfort, O comfort my people. Isaiah 40 is looking to a time when Israel's warfare has been ended and iniquity has been removed and the glory of Yahweh will be revealed and God's word abides forever. The good news of Isaiah 40 is the coming shepherd of Israel who will bring forgiveness and shepherd his sheep and make manifest the glory of Yahweh so that all flesh will see it. Well, Exodus 33, 14 spoke to the rest that comes to God's people. And with this reference to good news, Nahum is actually pulling forward into this message of hope and comfort for Judah, a message of the future, revealing of God's glory to all mankind and final rest. And Nahum 1, 15 is certainly, certainly an allusion to Isaiah 40, but it's also an explicit quote to Isaiah 52 and 53, 
where the good news proclaimed is nothing short of the full and final salvation of God's people. And that is in the introduction to that famous servant song of Isaiah 53, where he who is pierced for our transgressions took upon our sins upon himself. And by using this language of good news from Isaiah 40 and 52, Nahum speaks to the temporary good news that is Assyria's defeat, but he does so in a way as to purposely bring in language to point Judah to their greater hope. The great hope in the coming Messiah who would bring ultimate salvation and deliverance from all of their enemies and deliverance from sin. The good news that should be the hope of Judah is not just temporal relief from their enemies, but salvation and eternal rest. With that, we come to chapter 2, the coming judgment of God in verses 1 and 2. Let's read in chapter 2, verse 1. The one who scatters has come up against you. Guard the fortification, watch the road, strengthen your loins, instill your power with exceeding courage. For Yahweh will restore the majesty of Jacob. Like the majesty of Israel, even those who empty them have emptied them to destruction and ruined their vine branches. God, in speaking to Nineveh, taunts them and calls them to be ready themselves to the one who scatters. The the Medes and the Babylonians, though not named, are coming against them, and there is further hope here for Judah, the restoration of the majesty of Jacob. Notice he doesn't say Judah, but instead Jacob and Israel, even though the northern kingdom is already in captivity. This pictures a future restoration of not only Judah, but all 12 tribes of Israel. And remember Nahum was written as a book, meaning it was intended especially for future readers. The next generation, 40 years later, could actually read these words having witnessed the foretold destruction of Nineveh. That would instill hope that the promised future restoration of Israel would also come true and that Yahweh was worthy of being trusted. If his words would come true concerning Nineveh, won't also his promises to us come true? Well, in chapter chapter 2, verse 3, we get to a vision of Nineveh's destruction. A vision of Nineveh's destruction. Look at verse 3 of chapter 2. The shields of his mighty men are colored red. The valiant men are dressed in scarlet. The chariots are enveloped in flashing steel where he is set up to march. And the cypress spears are brandished. And the chariots race madly in the streets. They rush wildly in the squares. Their appearance is like torches. They dash to and fro with like lightning flashes. He remembers the mighty ones and they stumble in their march. They hurry to her wall and the mantlet is set up. The picture here is of both armies, both sides of the armies rushing to the wall to prepare for the attack. But then verse 6, the gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is melted away. So it stands fixed. She is exiled, she is carried away, and her maidservants are moaning like the sounds of doves beating on their hearts. Here is a vision of the soldiers of Nineveh and the Medes and the Babylonians prepared for battle, rushing to do battle at the wall, but then the unexpected comes. In verse 6, we have the description of the gates of the rivers being opened. This is the flooding of the Kosa River and the palace melting away in the rushing of the water. This, isn't a, this is more, should be understood as kind of a dissolving of the wall and the palace in the rushing water. And this is exactly what happened when the rivers overflowed in the third year of the siege. And the Babylonians entered the city. I mean, what perfect detail recorded in advance. God's word can be trusted. If such precise judgment would hold true, so would the promised restoration. Well, in verse 8 through the beginning of chapter 3, verse 7, we see a couple taunt songs of Nineveh's destruction. The first is, The taunt, where is the mighty nation? Look at verse 8 and read together. Though Nineveh was like a pool of water throughout her days, now they are fleeing. Stand, stand, but no one turns back. People flee. 
Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no limit to the treasure. Wealth from every kind of desirable object. She is emptied. Yes, she is emptied out and eviscerated. Hearts are melting and knees knocking. Also, anguish is in all their loins and their faces turn pale. It appears with the destruction of the wall, the inhabitants of Nineveh fled and the entire city was left to be plundered. In 1842, when Nineveh's remains were finally found after being lost to history for 2,000 years, it was expected because of her wealth that they would find stockpiles of gold or silver. But it was found empty. Its endless treasure was utterly plundered. Well, next, in verse 11, we see the once powerful royalty pictured as lions are mocked. Verse 11 of chapter 2, where is the den of lions and the feeding place of the young lions where the lion, lioness, and lion's cubs prowled with nothing to make them tremble? The lion tore enough for its cubs and strangled enough for its lionesses and filled its lairs with torn up prey and its dens with torn up flesh. Where are they now? Verse 13, behold, I am against you, declares Yahweh of hosts. And I will burn up her chariots in smoke, and a sword will devour your young lions. And I will cut off your prey from the land. No longer will the voice of your messengers be heard. Consider what it means for the sovereign God of all creation, who controls armies, nature, the whirlwinds, the floodwaters, and all of history, who will not leave sin unpunished to declare to you, I am against you. Where are you with God tonight? Is he against you? Either your refuge is in him or he is your enemy. There's no in between. And this should have served as a warning to Judah whose sins have been described as worse than the nations. If God is against Nineveh, how could he not be against Judah? He had promise restoration of the nation in the future but he would only be a refuge to them in the present if they would repent and find their refuge in him but Nineveh's eventual destruction just as God foretells here should clearly show them that God is in fact worthy of being trusted he is worthy of finding your refuge in well, the beginning of chapter 3, the, the, the taunt songs continue. Where is the lying nation, the manipulative nation? Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Woe to the city of bloodshed, completely full of deception and pillage. Her prey never departs, the sound of the whip and the sound of the rumbling of the wheel. Galloping horses and bounding chariots, horsemen charging, swords flaming, spears flashing. Many slain, a mass of corpses. And there is no end to dead bodies. They stumble over the dead bodies. And because of the many harlotries in the, of the harlot, the charming one, the mistress of sorceries who sells nations by her harlotries and families by her sorceries, behold, I am against you, declares Yahweh of hosts. And I will uncover your skirts over your face and show to the nations your nakedness and to the kingdoms your disgrace. I will throw detestable filth on you and display you as a wicked fool and set you up as a spectacle. And it will be that all who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is devastated. Who will console her? Where will I seek comforters for you? Nineveh is a bloody, lying, plundering city. It's fitting, fitting that the plunderer of 3-1 was the city who will be plundered in chapter 2, verse 9. And actually, this entire section is masterfully composed by the author from a literary perspective that would be striking to the original reader. There are several Hebrew word plays in this section, in this section and the section before it in chapter 2, that vividly describe, describe the reversal of Nineveh's fate. Some of them could be still seen in the English text. In 3.1, Nineveh is a plunderer, in 2.9, they will be plundered. In 2.9, there is no end to their treasure. In 3.3, there is no end to their dead bodies. 
In 2.9, the word for wealth is weight or mass, which is related to the word for glory. But in 3.3, 3, their weight or mass of riches has been replaced only by a weight or mass of corpses. In 3.4, their many harlotries has been replaced in 3.3 3 by many slain. This is the judgment that is to come upon Nineveh. Well, in chapter 3, verse 8, we begin to see that Nineveh's destruction is inevitable. And God asks them, are you better than Thebes? Recall Thebes was the northern capital of Egypt that Egypt or that Nineveh had actually destroyed. Verse 8, are you better than no Ammon or Thebes? which sits along the waters of the Nile with water surrounding her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall consisted of the sea. Ethiopia was her might and Egypt too without end. Put and Lubim were among her helpers, yet she became an exile. She went into captivity and her infants were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. They cast lots for her honorable, honorable men and all her great men were bound with fetters. Thebes was another mighty city whose destruction seemed impossible. But it was Assyria itself who had actually defeated Thebes. And if Thebes could be defeated, so too could Nineveh. Are you better than Thebes? And this should have been a comfort to Judah. Assyria had, a, had afflicted it for centuries. Surely nobody could defeat Nineveh. But just as Thebes was impossibly destroyed, so would Nineveh be destroyed, though it seems to Judah that it would be impossible. But God says it will happen. This brings hope. It should. And Nineveh's destruction and the futility of any efforts to stop it are described in verses 11 through 17. Look at verse 11, Nineveh's futile efforts. You too will become drunk. You will be hidden. You too will search for a strong defense from the enemy. All your fortifications are fig trees with ripe fruit. When shaken, they fall into the eater's mouth. Behold, your people are women in your midst. The gates of your land are open wide to your enemies. Fire consumes your gate bars. With the outer wall gone, the sieging armies are able to enter and set fire to the palace and continue its siege and attack. Look at verse 14. Chapter 3, verse 14, draw for yourself water for the siege, strengthen your fortifications, go into the clay and tread the mortar, take hold of the brick mold, there fire will consume you, the sword will cut you down, it will consume you as the locust does, multiply yourself like the creeping locust, multiply yourself like the swarming locust, you have increased your traders more than the stars of heaven, the creeping locust strips and flies away. Your guardsmen are like the swarming locust. Your marshals are like a locust swarm. Encamping in the stone walls on a cold day, the sun rises and they flee, and the place where they are is not known. Here, the Ninevite army is pictured as a large locust swarm. It was a great army. But here, this swarm is seen fleeing in a great mass, suddenly, just like the swarm of locusts. And later, they're nowhere to be found. And this is what will happen. This is what did happen to Nineveh. And the last two verses of the book, we see that Nineveh's destruction is final. Verse 18, your shepherds are sleeping. O king of Assyria, your mighty ones are lying down. Your people are scattered on the mountains and there is no one to regather them. There is no relief for your breakdown. Your wound is incurable. All who hear the report about you will clap their hands over you for on whom has not your evil passed continually? Nineveh would come to an end, along with his leaders. There would be no relief, no comfort, no cure. His wound was fatal. And at its demise, all who would hear it would rejoice. And Judah certainly would rejoice. But Judah itself was in sin, deep sin. And if such judgment would come against Nineveh, what judgment would come against Judah? Was there still hope for Judah? If Judah would but heed the words 
of Nahum 1, verse 7 and 8, it would find healing and refuge. Yahweh is good, a strong defense in the day of distress, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But if God would not be their refuge, if they trusted themselves and continued to insist on going their own way, following after the world and the nations, they too would suffer like Nineveh. We'll turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings 22. 2 Kings 22. Second Kings 21 describes how Manasseh had led Judah astray and Judah's next king, Ammon, did evil just as his father had done. And Judah was headed quickly toward the same fate as Nineveh. But after Ammon died, after a short two-year reign, God showed his compassion on Judah and gave them their last good king, Josiah. And we read about his reign in 2 Kings 22 and 23. And it was during Josiah's reign that the book of the law was again discovered, apparently being forgotten during the reigns of the evil kings. You wonder what kind of hearing did even Nahum get during those same reigns when even Moses was forgotten. And it's possible that during Josiah's reign might be when the book of Nahum was first known by the people. So look at 2 Kings 22.16 22.16 where Hilkiah the priest prophesies. 2 Kings 22.16 Thus says Yahweh, Behold, I am bringing evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore my wrath is set aflame against this place, and it shall not be quenched, But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of Yahweh, thus you shall say to him. And go ahead and skip to verse 19. Because your heart was soft, and you humbled yourself before Yahweh when you heard that I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become an object of horror and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I truly have heard you, declares Yahweh. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace, so that your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place. Like Nineveh, Judah would be judged. Um, But because of Josiah's humility and softness of heart before Yahweh, God would not bring this evil on Judah until after Josiah's death. And during Josiah's reign, God showed once again that he is slow to anger. He was patient with Judah. And Josiah implemented various reforms. They celebrated the Passover again for the first time since the days of the judges. And again, it's possible that during Josiah's 31-year reign that the people of Judah first read Nahum's prophecy while still under the thumb of Assyria. The death of their oppressor of Syria was just around the corner. Would they follow after Josiah and humble themselves before Yahweh and seek refuge in God? Well, 612 BC came. Josiah was still on the throne and Nineveh was destroyed exactly as Nahum had foretold. Would Josiah's generation heed the words and the comfort and the warning of Nahum? remembering that God would by no means leave the guilty unpunished? Would they fix their hope on the future promises and restoration of Israel that had been promised? All of the hope and comfort brought by the book of Nahum should have been felt most by them who would actually witness Nineveh's destruction in fulfillment of exactly how God proclaimed it would happen. God could be trusted. But three years later, in 609 BC, the entire kingdom of Assyria would fall to the Babylonians and King Josiah would die in that same year, only to be followed by evil kings. Judah would not listen, and seven years after Nineveh's destruction, 
the first deportation of Judah to Babylon would occur. The people of Judah missed the significance of Nahum's message. God judges sin, but there is hope, there is comfort. Seek your refuge in him. But they followed after their sin, and it led to their own destruction. Don't miss out, like Judah, on the importance of this message. God punishes sin. But he will also forgive the sin of everyone who takes refuge in him. A few decades earlier, Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah 53 about a future generation of Israel who, like Nahum's generation, had gone astray, like Manasseh had led them astray, but who, unlike Nineveh, will one day be healed. Isaiah 53, 5, we're familiar with this. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our peace fell upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Fall on him. Here we find the answer to the mystery of Exodus 34. How can our sin both be punished and forgiven? Only by Jesus Christ. God in the flesh taking on the punishment that we deserve for for our sin on the cross. Only on that basis, when our sin has actually been paid, the the price that we could never pay, can we actually be forgiven? The question was asked in Nahum 1.6, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? The answer, nobody. No man, no Ninevite, no Judite. Only God alone can endure the one who had no sin. And this is a hope for all of those who look to Jesus Christ as their refuge. Those who trust in Christ alone as their refuge, unlike Nineveh, whose wound was incurable, will find that their own wound of sin to be actually be cured by Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight, these same truths apply. God will judge sin, and it is a price we can never satisfy, though we have all eternity to do so. Nothing can satisfy his good and righteous anger against your sin, but God has provided the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And if you will look to him and him alone as your refuge, your your sins will be forgiven. Because Jesus' death on your behalf satisfies the penalty for the sins of all who trust in him. God is slow to anger, and he is patient, but his patience will not last forever. But if you're in Christ, be thankful to God for our refuge of Jesus Christ. Take a comfort that God's word can be trusted. If God's word came true in the fate of Nineveh, then we can be confident that every word will come true. We might face a time when we too will be oppressed in a similar way like Judah. But we we know God's word is true and we have an imperishable, undefiled, unshakable inheritance that is protected by God for us in heaven. And if we take and believe God's word, it holds hope and comfort, even in affliction, even in in tribulation, even in oppression. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that you have provided a refuge in Jesus Christ. Lord, who can endure your wrath and anger? We cannot. But your son took it upon himself that we might have hope. Lord, the hope that so many in Judah missed, Lord, stands before us today. Lord, I pray that those who are here would find their trust in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, may the book of Nahum grow our confidence in your word. Lord, your word is true. All of them are true. The most difficult words are true. The most comforting words are true. Lord, if you can precisely detail how the walls of a city will be washed away before it happens, 
decades before it happens. Lord, we can believe that everything that you've given us in your word is true. And Lord, we long for that day that where we will experience that eternal rest that was promised. In your name we pray, amen.